Welcome back to 3450. I'm your host, Joe Dobzinski. I have a special guest today as an author here at the Miami International Book Fair, Jakura. Jakira. Jakira. I'm sorry, Jakira. Diaz. And her book is called Ordinary Girls and Memoir. Um, first thing I'd ask you is, as, as I was reading through the book, there was times in the book that you were asking not to be an ordinary girl. Yes. And especially the one with, I think you guys were on swings in some park. Yes. And you were talking about the difference between people who do drug overdose then call 911? Um, yeah. Um, so part of what I was thinking about when I was looking for a title for this book is um, this idea. Um, when I was a teenager, I was very depressed and um, suicidal, to be honest with you. And there was a moment in the book where I depict suicidal ideation and at the time, we were having these conversations, my friends and I, about um, how we wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. It was this really weird, painful fantasy because we were in so much pain. And I was talking about how I, the worst possible thing you could be was an ordinary girl because ordinary girls took, just took sleeping pills and called 911 because they didn't really want to do it. Mm -hmm. So to me... I had this warped sense. I had a warped sense of self and a warped sense of um, that the worst way you could go out would be like someone who's not remembered. Um, in a lot of ways, this was, I mean, I was a teenager and I had no idea what, what I was even saying. We were just playing, pretending, performing um, what we thought was real um, to cover up our pain. And so to me, like the, the definition of what an ordinary girl is changes throughout the book, depending on my state of mind at the time, um, until the very end of the book when I realized, or as, when, I, when I was a grown woman, when I realized that um, the ordinary girls in the book were really the girls that saved me, that they were anything but ordinary. I guess the question I have is, at that point in your life as a teenager, yeah. I go back to before that when you used to watch Annie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the change up from Annie and what you describe in the book is yeah. what was thrilling about Annie, and you knew it was good and everything, to where you were talking about suicide. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it had to do with depression. I mean, mm -hmm. I was I I was very early on diagnosed with major depression, and I was struggling with it and not really telling anyone, but definitely attempting suicide. I attempted suicide for the first time when I was eleven. Mm -hmm. Part of it was that I didn't really understand how to go on. I didn't really know how to live with this which was it was a lot more than sadness and um my mother was also suffering from mental illness and was very abusive and um we often um got into fights and and got into like we we it was very difficult and mm -hmm. so um i i was a kid and didn't really see a way out and there's also a long history of suicide in my family and my maternal grandmother who also suffered from mental illness talked about it often and had attempted it and I was a child when I the first time that she ended up in the hospital after swallowing some pills and it was something that stuck with me and um while I didn't really understand the gravity of it at the time it seemed like an option for me um yeah I guess the thing that I have is, you know, I, I read the book, and mm -hmm. um, besides the cry for help, yeah, in a sense, do you, when you wrote the book, were you intending it? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that went through what you're mm -hmm. going through and still going through that. Mm -hmm. Were you writing it to say, hey, look, you can do this? Uh, yeah, I was, I was writing it in large part because I wanted people to see that there is hope, that there there is something better, Um that it's okay to reach out for help, that we often have similar stories and don't talk about this, that it's okay to talk about it and ask for help. Mm -hmm. I spent, I, I went through years where I didn't tell anyone how I was feeling, where I didn't ask for help. And now I realize that it would have been much easier for me if I had asked for help, um, that I didn't have to go through all that pain alone. I wanted people to see that my story wasn't unique, that so many of us go through this and come out on the other side and and I, I do hope that there's um, that we're abandoning that stigma of mental illness that people are able to reach out and say I have a mental illness and I need help and I'm suffering and it's 
um, just like people who have a physical illness, um, who, who feel pain, and that mm-hmm. it shouldn't be looked at as something that that you should have to deal with alone. That there, you should be able to, you know, seek professional help and to be okay. That it's okay to ask for that. I wanted. I also wanted to write this book because. I, I was a kid who loved to read and never saw myself in books, never saw books about people like me, girls who grew up in, pro- in poverty, who were queer, who um, were black and brown, who uh, were biracial, who were bilingual. I went to the library and asked librarians for books, and all the books they gave me were all written by white men. And I thought, to be a writer, you have to be a white man. And it wasn't until much later when I realized, oh, there are other writers and there are other books. And... I wanted to write a book about people like me, about them, but also for them. Mm-hmm. You talk about, you know, you're probably a, a forerunner in the queer industry in trying to get people to understand. Mm. And I think that that's the biggest problem of today. And I think your book kind of clears it up a little bit about you have to suffer through it, but it's okay. Yeah. And I think that that's a, it's a plus for your book because Thank I you. think it's, it's a very big issue on all scales, all levels, all whether you are very wealthy or whether you're very poor. Mm. And people seem to like forget that there's another society out there. Uh, yeah, it, it felt very much like that when I was growing up in Miami mm-hmm. Beach, that there was the Miami Beach that people see in, on TV, and then there was a completely different Miami Beach. Um, and I wanted my book to, be, to say, your life is valuable mm-hmm. to people who, who don't have that life that's portrayed on TV. Do you, when you, do you talk in front of groups of I do. LGBTQs? I, I do talk in front of groups of queer people. Yeah, mm-hmm. sometimes students. Um, I, I've been on book tour for about a month and going to bookstores, other kinds of events. Yes. What have you found that you'd like to add to your book eventually? I mean, it seems like when you start talking to people mm-hmm. one-on-one yeah. or as a group, you really discover that you know, you're on the right track, but you would like to have added, added this instead. Um, so I have found it enlightening to talk to teenagers who can so openly come out and say, I'm queer, I'm gay, I'm bisexual, I'm transgender, who who feel like there's a space to talk about that openly now and that we've made some progress. When I was a teenager, it was something that I felt like I needed to keep to myself because it was dangerous to talk about. Um, I lived on Miami Beach, which was in a lot of ways a gay mecca there were so many queer people in miami beach Mm -hmm. and yet there were still people who yelled things in the street who used homophobic slurs um and that seemed acceptable and it felt very much like we needed to live in hiding and now that's not the case so much even though there we still have a long way to go but i feel like the more queer people are visible the more we're out there doing positive things and just living our lives with joy and going to work and raising families the more people can see us as normal like as mm-hmm. human beings just trying to live mm-hmm. their lives like everyone else the, the more we can accomplish together as a society you know basically you, you talk a lot about miami beach yes what do you feel in, in uh, fort lauderdale which has a very large Mm-hmm. LGBTQ. I mean, probably I, I've been told that mm-hmm. San Francisco and Fort Lauderdale are sometimes neck to neck. Um, there's uh, Wilton Manors, which is one of the mm-hmm. largest right. queer communities in the United mm-hmm. States. I'm not very sure about Fort Lauderdale because I don't spend a lot of time there. I, I grew up in Miami Beach and I live in Miami Beach mm-hmm. and I split my time now from Miami Beach and between Miami Beach and Montreal, Canada. And um, the two places have are very liberal, although very different. Um, there are t- places in the in the U.S. that are, for me, considered pl- like hubs of gay culture, of queer culture that feel safe for me and my partner. Um, but I also feel that in this political climate, that we've taken a few steps backward, like the United States in general, um, that it, it doesn't always. Feel feel safe to move mm-hmm. around um easily like it's not it's it's something that my partner and i are very wary of did your partner and you both work on the book together uh no i worked on the book myself and then met my partner after the book was written uh, so i guess the major problem that i see today mm-hmm. uh being in the queer society is the transgenders which seem to be picked off the street and murdered almost um 
sorry, transgender people mm-hmm. um, is is sorry the correct term. One of one of the problems that's happening in the U.S. It's a major. It's a huge problem. Is that people who are transgender ha- have have ex- experienced a lot of violence just day to day. It's often a problem to use a restroom. It's often a problem to just live and just walk to work or commute to work or just doing everyday things um, that you normally would consider as a cisgender person um, normal and easy. People who are transgender have a very difficult time just living their everyday lives. Um, And then that's also not my experience. I can't really speak to um, what the experience of a transgender person is or would be. Um, but, but yes, I think it's something that we all have to be aware of as people who are cisgender, how it is in a lot of ways, our responsibility to try to make the world better and safer for everyone, including people who are trans. I consider it my personal responsibility to try, um, to educate people wherever I go about, um, all of us just being kinder to each other but it's also it's not i'm not transgender so i can't really speak to what the experience of a transgender woman or a transgender man would be so the journey from puerto rico to miami as you went through that what were some of the differences i mean did puerto rico treat you the same way as miami people did i mean you know you were you were at that time mm-hmm. that you were doing that you we were just not beginning, but we still haven't got up to where people understand people. And I think that's the biggest problem we have, which I find your book describes a lot more about, hey, I'm normal, mm-hmm. even though I have all these problems. Um, in, so the, to answer your first question, in Puerto Rico, um, I felt, I did feel a sense of home. Things, things changed when we moved to the U.S., to Miami. Um, my father had to work two, sometimes three jobs to make ends meet. Um, and then my mother was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She was suffering from mental illness. And we, because we were poor, mental health wasn't really, um, mental health care wasn't really the best. And so this is a problem that, you know, people who live in poverty or who are in working class families and uninsured in the U.S. are still dealing with today, that we don't really have adequate mental health care and um, the people who do have adequate mental health care, people who can afford it, who can afford to have the good insurance. Um, and so it was very difficult for us after we arrived in the United States because my mother didn't have adequate mental health care. And that started what was eventually a long cycle of a lot of different problems, including my mother, once, while she was suffering symptoms, being very abusive. I guess... It, it, to me, the book was so in depth mm. with discussions. I mean, it had to be hard to bring back some of those memories, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Some of some of the things are very painful, and mm-hmm. so writing about them was very painful and took a toll on me. Yeah, physically and emotionally, I had a lot of sleepless nights. Mm. It seems to, to me that well, I'm hoping that the book put a lot of stuff behind you. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that's the key. It is, and I think that if more people read the book. They may you may get contacted, but besides that, mm-hmm. I think that there is an opportunity there for people to say, like I mentioned, I'm normal. Yeah, I just you know I just don't seem normal to you, but I am normal. Um, so one of one of the things that I try that I wanted the book to do was to open up discussions mm-hmm. and to get people thinking about things that they may not really have thought about before to see the perspective, um, the world from a different perspective. There are um, things in the book about race, about gender, about sexuality, about violence, about girlhood, about Puerto Rico, about Miami Beach, about a lot of different things, about family and friendship and love. And I do um, I do intend for this book to be, in a lot of ways, somewhere to begin a conversation, right? It's to start conversations um, openly about those things. And I hope that the book, it does open a window into... A, a life that you may not be familiar with. Well, I think it's probably people are familiar with it, mm-hmm. but you know, I hate to say this, but scared of it a little bit. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. It seems to me that 
you know, with you writing the book the way you did, mm -hmm. it became more personal.